So in a sec, I'm going to let folks introduce themselves. But just to tell you who's here in front of you, we have LaShawn AZ. Um, we have Jane Pinkard. We have Aaron Trammell. We have Jeff Watson and Amelia Yang. Um, some of the folks you'll see here are game scholars. Some of them are game makers. Um, many of you do both of those things. Uh, so you get a, a diversity of perspectives. Um, and some of the things we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to think about the relationship between games and politics, uh, what, it makes, what it means to make games right now in this current political moment, um, and what we can do as uh, people who make games, who study games, who teach games, to fight oppression, to find our place um, at, a, at a really difficult political time. I'm Jane Pinkard. Um, yeah, I'm a writer and educator um, at uh, University of Southern California. Um, how my work engages with it, I think I've always been interested in how power operates. Like all of my writing is, has been sort of about that in one way or another. Um, and I'm also really interested in, in like role play and participatory theater and um, and so I, I actually this is a research question I'd love to discuss further with the room is like how do we um, you know how do we move from um, you know role playing in these sort of safe and uh, structured scenarios out into the world like how do we train say activists um, you know through sort of theatrical um, methodologies and so that's sort of what I've been thinking about and working on. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. How are you? Yay. Uh, my name is Amelia. I'm a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Media Arts and Practice Program at USC. Um, I'm really a media maker, but also a scholar, really interested, came more from like an activist background to more like a scholarly background. And I got I'm honorary IMGD somehow, have found a place with the games people because it's such a beautiful community and to collaborate with many of them. And I think one of the reasons I find games so attractive is the fact that politics is so serious sometimes and it just tries to tap on the rational. And I think games and media um, go into more like our emotional, um, I don't know, how do you call that? Um, you know, when the register, thank you. <laughs> so um, that's why I feel like um, I'm really like drawn into games and how they can create structures of participation. Uh, hi, I'm Lee Shanezi. Uh, I also was at USC. I graduated from the games uh, MFA program. Um, and I guess my work engages politics in a couple ways. Uh, recently, I've been interested in how uh, games can sort of like uplift stories of resistance and also how it can get folks like involved in activism directly. Uh, and so my thesis project engaged a bit with that and I'm still trying to kind of figure out how I can do that more. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Aaron Trammell. I am honored to be here and a concerned citizen and a professor at UC Irvine, along with Bo. Um, and uh, my work looks at how um, sort of ideology, both from the grassroots and sort of elite sectors, mix and mingle in um, third spaces. So um, I'm really excited to be here, and I can't wait to have a conversation. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Watson. I'm a professor at USC. Um, my interest is in, sort of, it's split. I, I'm a designer. I'm really interested in how, uh, you know, my background is in uh, cinematic storytelling and, and filmmaking. And uh, in the early 2000s, I sort of became interested in, in what could we do with uh, the web and uh, interactive media generally as, uh, as a way of telling stories. And very quickly, I realized, you know, this technology is much better for facilitating play and, and facilitating performance and, and participation. Uh, and so that sort of led me down this uh, long pathway. I, I actually went through the PhD program at USC. Tracy, hello. Um, uh, you know, so I, I, as a scholar then, I've sort of continued to, uh, with that investigation, I'm very interested in this sort of Venn diagram that might be composed of play, power, and technology. Uh, and how those three things interrelate, and sort of the shocking reality that every day, hundreds of millions of hours 
on this planet of playtime are structured by machines and software created by some of the largest corporations on the planet. So I, I find that a very interesting thing to contemplate. It occurs to me I should introduce myself too. I'm Bonnie Ruberg, or Bo. Um, I am a professor at UC Irvine with Aaron and formerly uh, was a postdoc at USC with many of these wonderful USC folks. Um, I work on queer issues in video games. And so for me, politics, um, something I think about a little bit more broadly than politics with a kind of capital P. I'm thinking about um, identity, I'm thinking about culture, I'm thinking about access. And my thing is really just that, for me, there's no such thing as an apolitical game or an apolitical way to have fun, right? I think fun is, is important, I think games are amazing, um, but that politics need to be part of the conversation always, right? Because power and privilege are always part of the way that we make games. Um, and I'm especially passionate about that when it comes to how we teach our students and the way that we teach our students to think about the games that they make. Um, so that's my not so secret agenda in this kind of conversation. Um, so maybe I could open it up to you folks with a, a broad question, um, which is just what you think the relationship between games and politics should be. And the reason I'm thinking about that is that often in games cultures, different game communities, there's a lot of resistance to the idea that games should have any relation to politics or that we should think about games at all as political. So what do you think about this idea that there, there is a relationship between games and politics? Well, I'll just speak because I have the mic. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, for me, one of the most pernicious ideas around is the sort of escapist idea that there is this category of activity that we can do that represents a, a real escape from the world in, in one way or another that separates us. You know, uh, this is the sort of distorted misunderstanding of the magic circle, right? It's, a, it's sort of a piece with this where it's, um, you know, this idea that there are these play spaces that have no implications on the rest of the world and that the fact that you're in that play space and not somewhere else doesn't have any effect on the rest of the world. To me, that seems like, you know, the very baseline of play plays sort of productivity, it's engagement with the things that concern us all, which is the definition of politics, um, you know, uh, it, it is, it's just material, right? It's the, you're either there or you're not. You're either playing, you're playing this game or you're playing that game. That changes the whole matrix of the universe, right? So there's a, there's a very kind of like fundamental, like physical um, thing that's being denied when we argue that uh, you know, plays uh, and games can be, or anything can really be apolitical, we're social animals. Everything that we do relates back into that system and co-constructs it. And so I think to give games a pass and say, oh no, this, because this is fun and play, you know, it's not related to the unfolding of our social structures, you know, is, is kind of like a willful blindness. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just bounce off that very briefly. Um, I, I want to ricochet with a question which isn't um, uh, why do people, uh, which is why do people see games as unpolitical? And like, wh how did this moment come to be? Because it's really a historical anomaly that we're at a moment where people say this is just leisure. Um, think about things like war games, right? Like this is very obviously a political kind of game. Um, think about things uh, like, uh, I'm sorry, uh, War games and uh, uh, I had it in my head earlier. Um, I'm gonna move the mic down, and other people will add, and I will. It'll come to you. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, so just to speak to what Bo was saying about how all games are political. Um, I mean, I think that the games that get called political are the ones that have it, like agendas that are uh, a little easier to see because they differ from the agendas that all the games we play are, but. I think what's invisible to us is like a statement about uh, where, how we've already been trained and things like white supremacy are invisible, things like capitalism are invisible. So when you have a game that's about colonizing a group of people or about taking over a land, we don't think of it as a political game and we can call that escapist because it's sort of like aligned with the agendas that we are so used to like seeing as normal. Uh, and then when someone comes along and has a game where maybe you're like resisting uh, that group that's colonizing, then it gets called a political game, right? Um, and so I guess, yeah, so agreeing with Bonnie that all games are political. Um, and I, I do think that there's still room for it. Like, I mean, escapism is, is useful also. And I don't think that uh, 
all games need to be the same and that everyone needs to be out here making like hardcore political agendas in their game, but um, by sort of like bringing attention to these issues and having, uh, well, yeah, I'm just gonna stop there. <laughs> I echo all of your comments. Um, I think something important to consider is like what is considered a game and what do games represent and what do games simulate as uh, sometimes there's like in, in a lot of games like people are represented without similar in film right without like being actually consulted like people from that identity or like all these things we think about that without being like that if we think about that without being with a like political approach we can like fall into like a bunch of holes I think that's one thing and then the actions that they simulate like you said like either colonizing or just grabbing land and or doing all these things can also I don't know like have another type of message inside intrinsic in its gameplay so just like thinking about these things Right, I mean, I think your question of, you know, where games should, I mean, I feel like all artists, game artists as well as all artists, um, especially marginalized artists, have always um, viewed art as inherently political because our lives are inherently politicized, you know? Like, you can't escape from it. So, but I feel like this, qu um, this question is and should be more urgent than ever um, with the rise of authoritarianism across the globe. Like, you know, it's so stark. Um, but sometimes, and this is a question I'm going to bounce out to all of you, because sometimes I despair, actually, that, um, that games can have anything to do with anything. Like, I wonder, are we putting on panels like this to justify our own inactions? Because we're scared of taking meaningful action that actually risks something, right? Um, like interventions that could actually be risky to us. Um, and I, I, I worry about that, I despair sometimes. So the question isn't so much, can games make a difference in political spaces, but are we as game makers, as people who study and teach games, not doing enough yet and trying to kind of tell ourselves we're thinking these questions where actually we should be putting ourselves on the line? Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, I read, uh, I don't know, like, I read from different type of, not necessarily just game studies, but this scholar that has this concept called adversarial design, right? And in this concept, he says um, that multiple ideolo ideologies can be in conflict and people can be kind of like inside and you get to see those ideologies, right? Like resistance versus oppression in one specific space. But then there was another critique because that's how academy works, right? Somebody says something, the other person criticizes and you learn. And the critique was like, if that would do anything, then it would be illegal, right? So we have to consider, I don't know, I'm not just telling people like, let's go and do illegal things. <laughs> but we have to consider that when you resist, there's also gonna be some pressure from what you're resisting that is gonna make your heart life, like your lives harder. So it's kind of like, it's a decision, it's a commitment, it's like also finding ways to make an intervention without putting yourself in, in risk, also like just being smart. So that's kind of like what I think about your comment. <laughs> Yeah, so so I think uh, just just bouncing off of that a little, um, you know, I feel like in an era of alternative facts and um, and the rest of it, uh, you know, there is a sense that I have that we're in a, a kind of a post rhetorical moment, um, and maybe you know also just because of what the internet has done. The internet to me is like a slow moving nuclear bomb that's just destroying the whole planet. And what it, I think it has done. Um, you know, with, with rhetoric and with argumentation and with, with being able to have like a, a sort of thesis, antithesis, synthesis type of process is that there are competing claims to facticity that um, are, are very difficult in this sort of era of extremely complex problems like say climate change, which are very hard to like just show to some, oh, here's climate change. You know, you can say, oh, there's all these hurricanes. Someone else will say, oh yeah, but that's just normal cyclical weather stuff. And and so we're actually, I feel like 
the emphasis, because in some ways games, and this sort of touches a bit on, I think, what Genova was saying earlier, to some degree games um, have, have often sort of looked to the cinema and looked to this kind of um, spectacular mode of storytelling and argumentation to be serious games. And that, that many serious games dwell in that space of representation and, and seek to say something. And I think saying something is important. We have to say things over and evidently we have to say things over and over again. And still people won't listen to them. So I think I think that beyond just sort of trying to argue our, our way out of you know this epochal crisis in uh, Western democracy, we need to act our way out of it. And so I think as we think about games, we can also think not just about what games can say, but also what they can do. Because games are, at the bottom, uh, methods for scaffolding and facilitating human performance. And I see a question from the audience. And I will run the mic over. I, just, I have more of a comment, actually. I find it fascinating and that we're focusing on resistance and activism um, rather than redesigning the system itself. Um, because, you know, games, yes, they are in some ways a medium, but they're also, um, they can be so much more than that because they are related deeply to the systems that um, form all of the issues that we're talking about uh, in terms of resistance. So, you know, as game designers, we are some of the most qualified people in the world to, for example, think about the issues about the outdated systems of government that have produced the, 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 the issues of the day, right? And sometimes, there is a requirement to redefine those underlying structures that are outdated, you know, and, and we're just sitting in a community of people who think about building and rebuilding, iterating on structures, um, as opposed to simply just participating in them or resisting them, redefining them, propose, I mean, why are we not training people to actually be the system and ch change from within and build a better game for us all to play together in, in, in ways that enrich our lives rather than produce these kind of, you know, ridiculous situations. Yeah, so uh, that's a great point. Thank you, uh, Tracy. Um, so I, I, I often think about games um, as very system-oriented, right? These are structures that replicate often social systems. And I often think about play as a space of resistance. This is the space where one can resist that system which might be oppressing them or which they might not be oppressing them and they might want to play with it. Um, so actually with contemporary politics, I've been thinking a lot that it's, it's been tricky because we often want to see ourselves as the resistance, but actually the system has been what's been keeping many of us safe. It's laws and regulations that say you can't discriminate against people of color, against you know people of LGBTQ identities and stuff like that that keep these people safe. And yet, the alt-right has gotten really good at playing with our rhetoric, with language, and all of these different modes of resistance that require play within a system. And I think this is a key problem right now is that people aren't recognizing that it's not a matter of resistance, it's a matter of structure, and what the structure can accommodate and or resist. Yeah, I think, Tracy, your point, and also uh, Jane and Aaron's point, so that's a really nice transition to something I was going to ask you a little bit more broadly, which is just as game designers, uh, you know, folks who study games, what can we do, right? And so that might be about resistance, it might be about redefining systems themselves, um, but what are, our, what are our spaces of possibility for responding to the, the moment that we find ourselves in? I just have a general note, which is I feel like the the crisis is so urgent that um, uh, we can uh, look towards and we should continue to look towards the systemic fixes. And and, and I think as, as Aaron was uh, sort of suggesting, that, that a lot of the institutions that have been in place in this country are being torn apart by this administration and by the by their supporters. Um, and, and I think you know, we need to continue that process of, of supporting um, those institutions and, and trying to keep uh, uh, some semblance of law and order going um, as this goes on. And so you know, my, my answer to the question of what should we do, I feel like in the near term what we should do really is uh, strike en masse. Yeah. And I don't think that video game design 
is particularly germane to solving this urgent crisis. I do think game design and systems thinking are. But I think as far as like hoping that we can create games that are going to agitate to bail us out of this death spiral, um, I think we're in a, a very dangerous situation right now. And we should gear all our energies towards that. And it, I think it feeds back into our pedagogy, too. More uplifting comment than that. <laughs> oh, oh. No, it was you. <laughs> um, OK. I was thinking a lot of things with Tracy's and your comment. I think we cannot give all the responsibility to games, for example. It's like we cannot give all the responsibility to the arts. I think organizing is like the best way to like try to confront the system. Like doing the games and doing the materials is just a pretext. Listen, Jeff is like my professor. I'm in his camp. <laughs> it's a pretext to talk about the issues. But the actual mobilization, mobilization and the actual like struggle, it has to do with organization of movements. So for me, I don't see the answer in the design of the games, and that's just like the activist in me talking. But I think that they're also important. They're just like part of the culture that we're all building. That's how I see it. Yeah, and just to add to that, like for me, one frustration I've had with activism is also not knowing what to do. And so <laughs> I think that just kind of extends into game design because it's like, oh, I have this amazing opportunity to get the player to do something. Now what do I want them to do? Well, what do I want to do? And that, so it's like, it's a continuation of that sort of confusion. I think um, activism is sort of like in a, I mean, not to say like there's one giant thing that is activism, but I'd say like broadly that's a challenge that activists have been facing recently is like activism hasn't changed much in the past 50 years. And uh, I guess trying to figure out new ways of uh, resisting, whether you see that as like creating new systems or getting rid of those systems altogether or whatever that means to you uh, is figuring out what to do. And then as the game designer, figuring out what you want your player to do. Yeah, so I was thinking about these points that were just made about you know striking and bodies in motion. How do we mobilize bodies? And uh, you know, I think that's a, a really clear design break that people can folks can look to. So instead of being cynical and saying you know games are just a replica of society, can recognize that they might be in dialogue with society and things that happen in games might be reproduced on several layers. And maybe we can think of games of the body or ways to mobilize bodies in games more because I think that the intellectualization of chess is what's outdated and the body is actually where this sort of resistance and movement might be. You know, like games are amazing at moving bodies around. Like if you think about sports, right? You, you, you set up this sort of, this set of objectives and responsibilities and resources and constraints. Um, and then people will like hurl their bodies into each other. I don't want to sound cynical. I think the, prob the crisis is urgent, but I do think that game design can offer um, principles that can be imported into organizing. You know, that, that you know, so much of game design is about um, you know, inviting people to play, or as Tracy's always told me, you know, providing the player with an opportunity where they get to do something. Right? And, and I think with activism, and with, particularly with democracy, that we actually have a lot at our disposal to enable people like to, to show them, hey, you get to determine the future of your country. You know? And I think in some ways that the fact that we're so diso or, or, uh, separated from, from feeling like we have some say and some control over our country, that, that, that is sort of part of what video games are echoing for us in some ways about where we're at as a society, that a video game provides us a context wherein our actions can have impact and can be meaningful and where we can see feedback right away and we can't see that outside. So I think, you know, again, it comes back to thinking about how we can use game design to re redesign the system, but also how we can use it to design insurgency. One of the projects I've been working on is trying to figure out a way to, yeah, like criticize the status quo, but also not putting ourselves kind of in danger because I'm an international student and like all the group is like very diverse and right, like all the dangers that they can, that can imply. So we're trying to be anonymous and like, but that, what does that take is like 
We have to refuse our authorship. We have to refuse uh, the fact that I'm gonna not put it on my CV. It just has to live on its own. So it's kind of like strategies, as I said, of taking risks. So that's kind of like where I am in what I'm doing and the challenges that I'm facing because like it can be sometimes things that are around social justice can be institutionalized and can be sanctioned by the institution. But in other cases, as I said, they don't have a place there. So that's kind of like where I am. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out what, how I can, uh, I, like I, I don't know if I want to put myself on the line exactly. I have I'm like always like it's a constant negotiation of how much am I willing to risk as a black woman, and um, but it's it's been just how you mentioned uh, how like speaking of things in front of a class. I'm currently teaching as well, and uh, we'll be teaching a very political class next semester, and just thinking about like who, what kind of students might end up in my class, and is kind of. Terrifying, um, and even like being at Indicate exhibiting a game where I have to constantly be telling to a white audience, um, and this was the white newspaper, and this was the horrible things that they were reporting, and you can guess what, you know, it, it's, so uh, yeah, I, so that's kind of a thing that I'm struggling with is how, um, how to stay true to what I wanna make, um, and like negotiating those risks, but I don't have an answer. Um, so I, I I want to put slightly controversial, I'm on your side, I promise, uh, <laughs> point out there. But I, I do think that we need to interrogate this idea of safe spaces and what they are. I kind of feel like after uh, the last eight years of competent governance, we all got a little soft and uh, started taking for granted many, many, many things. And so I, like an old story, when I was a kid, um, I was playing manhunt with a bunch of friends and I ran through a neighbor's yard that was out of bounds to cheat the rules of the game and I ran into um, basically a uh, invisible wire that was holding a pot. I chipped my tooth, it's still chipped to this day from that. And those boundaries are there for a reason. And I can appreciate that now. But I would have never appreciated that had I never chipped my tooth. I would have never recognized that those boundaries are there for a reason. And so I think there's two sides of the safe space that we need to be looking at. One is the person who doesn't recognize the boundaries are there might actually need to burn themselves in the fire a little to recognize why these systems and rules are important. And then the other side is the person who has burned their side themselves in the fire or been burned by some awful human being needs to have the respect and get that safety. And I think it's both, you can't, you can't just make a safe space because then those people are just gonna foam at the mouth and not understand because they're never gonna get burned.